downstream Vs are areas where the water is flowing through the path of least resistance in the shape of the letter V. Sometimes called tongues, these areas contain water flowing downstream, which again is called laminar flow. Usually most of the water in a downstream V has little aeration, and so it appears as clear or dark. In easy rapids, if you're trying to make your way downstream, either swimming or by boat, a common strategy is to link the downstream Vs as you make your way down the rapid because the surface is free of obstacles in the Vs. Just be aware that in difficult and dangerous rapids, downstream Vs can lead you directly into major hazards. Often in or towards the end of a downstream V, we find a series of waves in a row. These are called standing waves. Standing waves are created by pressure. The water is accelerating as it flows downhill and is being squeezed between the eddies, the river bottom, the slower moving water downstream, and other features. And because you can't squeeze water, the pressure forces it up into a series of waves. If you're swimming or boating in a rapid, a series of standing waves often make for a good route down. Of course, very large, high volume rivers can also have giant standing waves. Other waves are created by rocks. As the river flows over a rock, the water can get forced up and form a wave. These are good to recognize because if you swim or boat through one of these waves, depending on how shallow it is, you're more likely to hit a rock than if it was a standing wave. Sometimes these waves are mixed in with standing waves and they can be hard to tell the difference between them, but one way to tell the difference is that a series of standing waves usually looks fairly uniform. The shape of the waves follows a pattern, whereas a wave formed by a rock will often have the face at a different angle or it might be breaking differently. As you get more experience reading water, you get better at telling the difference and recognizing where hidden rocks might be by looking at the water surface. A hole also known as a hydraulic, occurs when there's a rock or ledge in the river and the water drops vertically over the downstream side of it. The water falls with velocity down towards the river bottom and then continues on its way downstream, but because the water wants to find its own level, some current gets sucked back upstream to fill the void. This creates a recirculating effect. In a hole, the water moves in four phases, down, out, up, and back. In phase one, the water drops down toward the river bottom. The part of phase one that's above the surface and visible to us usually appears like dark, clear, or hard water, and this is often called the pour over. Phase two is where it moves downstream along the river bottom. This section can't be seen from above the surface. Phase three is where it rises back up towards the surface. This is called the boil line because the water looks like it's boiling up to the surface. And phase four is called the backwash or foam pile where the water flows back upstream. The backwash is often white because it's aerated. Holes can be dangerous features or they can be totally harmless and even fun features for boaters to play in. It depends on how retentive they are, meaning how much they'll hold a swimmer and continue to recirculate them versus spit them out downstream. The retentiveness of a hole depends on a bunch of variables, including the shape of the rock, the amount of water, and the river depth. One thing to look at is how far away the boil line is from the pour over. If this distance is only a meter or a few feet, generally the hole is easier to escape from or not recirculate in in the first place. If the boil line's very far away from the drop, this makes for a more retentive hole. Another factor is the shape of the hole. Generally, if the ends are pointed downstream, it will be easier to escape from because you can swim or paddle to a corner or just, push or just be pushed towards the corner by the incoming current. And because the corners are where the hole is weakest and the most water is escaping there, you can get out. If the ends are pointed upstream, as you try to swim or paddle towards the corner, the incoming current will keep pushing you back towards the middle of the hole. And it can be difficult to impossible to escape from the corners. In these cases, your best chance is to escape by first swimming upstream into the water of phase one, then balling up to sink down with that water and hopefully travel as far downstream as you can with phase two 
So you resurface downstream of the boil line in an area we call the outwash. This is a technique that we practice in, con in a controlled environment in our technician level courses when conditions allow, and it works well, but it takes some practice and experience. Also, some holes are just straight up dangerous and so difficult to escape from that we just need to stay away from them at all costs. Two features that may look similar to the untrained eye, but act very differently from each other, are crashing waves versus holes. A crashing wave is a wave that's steep enough at the crest that some water crashes back upstream. This creates a foam pile that on the surface can look like the backwash of a hole. Sometimes really buoyant objects like boats can stay surfing in the foam pile with gravity and the crashing water keeping them on the upstream side of the wave. But there's a big difference below the surface. Just below the surface of a crashing wave, all the water is moving downstream. This means that anything that sinks down a bit below the surface will be pushed downstream and free of the wave. For example, if a boater is stuck surfing on a foam pile and can't surf off, if they want to bail, they can either flip over or swim out of their boat, and because their body will be below the surface, they'll escape the wave. If you're evaluating the safety of doing a rescue in a rapid, recognizing a feature as a wave which isn't retentive versus a hole which is retentive can make a big difference in your decision making around the safety and consequences of working upstream of that feature. To get proficient at reading water, you need to spend time scouting rivers, looking from shore, and really trying to understand what the water's doing. You can build your knowledge and understanding by throwing sticks into waves and holes, uh, floating empty boats into them, and scouting rapids with experienced boaters and rescuers who you can ask questions to. Another feature is a pillow. Say you have a rock or a wall and the river's flowing into it, but there's not quite enough water to get over it. The water will deflect off of the rock, crashing back onto itself. This is called a pillow. It's not necessarily a good or bad thing, it's just something good to be able to recognize. Now to move on to some dangerous features. First, strainers. A strainer is anything in the river that allows the water to pass through it but not the bigger objects. Think of it like a pasta strainer where the water can flow through but the noodles get stuck. Strainers are extremely dangerous because if a person floats into one, they can be pushed underwater and pinned onto the strainer by the current. The most common strainers in rivers are trees, but other things can create strainers as well. In flood situations, things like guardrails and vehicles and other debris can become strainers. For paddlers, a wrapped or pinned boat with water flowing under and through it can be a strainer as well. Strainers are something we need to have a lot of respect for and avoid. Even in mild current, a strainer can be difficult to impossible to rescue yourself from and very difficult to rescue a subject off of. On our beginner rescue courses, students get an opportunity to swim into a mock strainer, usually a PVC pipe that's held up by the instructors in mild current and you'll try to swim over it and also feel what it's like to be stuck on it. The idea of the activity is not to make you think, oh, now I know how to swim over strainers, but instead to realize how dangerous the situation would be if it were an actual tree with branches hanging down in the water. Many people have drowned in strainers, including experienced boaters and rescuers. Rock sieves, or siphons, occur when boulders pile up in a way that allows the water to pass through the spaces between them. They act like a strainer. A similar feature can also be created when erosion carves a tunnel through bedrock. To identify a sieve, look at the current flowing towards a jumble of rocks and the water immediately downstream. If the current is being deflected and there's an eddy in relatively calm water just downstream, it's likely safe. If there seems to be a lot of water flowing into the rock and then disappearing and coming out on the downstream side, stay away. An undercut is a feature that occurs when the water flows into a cave under the riverbank or the sloping side of a boulder. If a swimmer gets pushed into an undercut, they could get entrapped and pinned underwater by the force of the current. Undercuts can be very dangerous since the entrance of the cave can be entirely under the surface of the water, making it difficult to even notice or know it's there. 
One way to check for undercuts is to look carefully at the places where the water's flowing into boulders, islands, and riverbanks. If the water's hitting a solid wall, we'd expect it to deflect off and cause a pillow. When water's flowing toward a rock feature and disappearing instead of getting deflected, that's the sign of an undercut. Really important to keep in mind, though, that often you can have both a pillow and an undercut together at the same time, meaning some of the water is being deflected, but other current might be pushing into a cave. The only way to be certain that there's no undercut is to see the feature at much lower water levels. That's why having local knowledge of rivers at all water levels is so important for both rescue teams and river guides. Certain types of rock, like limestone or other soft sedimentary bedrock, are more prone to features like sieves and undercuts. For example, some rivers in the southeastern U.S., like the Chattooga in Georgia, have rocks that are like Swiss cheese that present huge danger with water disappearing into tunnels and sometimes shooting out of small cracks way downstream. Rivers that are full of boulders of various sizes, like creeks and mountain chains, generally have more sieves and undercuts than rivers with ancient hard bedrock like the Canadian Shield. But those are just generalizations. Undercuts and sieves do occur everywhere, which is why we need to scout vigilantly and seek out local knowledge. You see a horizon line when you're looking downstream on a steep section of river, and there's a sudden drop, and it's not possible to see the rapids below. From that vantage point, only a horizon line is visible. The water will disappear over the drop, and a section of the river is out of sight. This could indicate either a big rapid or waterfall, or just some small ripples. It's hard to tell. If the water is moving slowly above this point, it may be possible to get close enough in a boat to see the rapid, while still having the option of retreating upstream and heading to shore. We call this boat scouting. People in canoes or rafts will often stand up to get a better vantage point. If it's not possible to see over the brink, it's a blind drop. Paddlers of all experience levels should scout blind drops from shore. Keep in mind that even on a familiar river, new strainers can fall into the river at any time. We hope this video has improved your awareness and ability to start recognizing these features. If you get better and better at reading water and understanding hydrology, you'll be able to leverage the power of the river so you can work with the water while you're running rivers and doing rescues. Being able to identify truly dangerous features will help you make good decisions and help keep yourself and others safe and tell the difference between perceived risk and actual risk. There are lots of sections of river that have very low actual risk to swimming or boating through. Other sections are chock full of hazards. To the untrained eye, huge waves might seem more dangerous than undercuts and strainers when in fact the opposite is true. So keep practicing foundational rescue skills like swimming, throw bagging, and contact rescues, but also keep practicing reading water and asking questions about why the current's moving the way it is. And you'll eventually get to a point where you can make great decisions on the water and you'll become excellent at swift water and whitewater rescue.